as the Jaguar sprang, Agile was dimly aware that the girl crouched by the fire hurled a spear from a throwing stick in her right hand. The butt of the spear was in, the no in a notch in the throwing st stick. She hurled the spear with tremendous force into the side of the jaguar behind its, uh, behind its left leg as it was jumping. The force was so great, the spear went almost through the animal. The force was so great that it knocked the jaguar into the bushes moment for a moment. And when it, it snarled and roared and spun and leaped for the girl across the fire right at the girl, but with lightning speed, she had put a second spear into the throwing stick and at point blank range, she fired it down the jaguar's throat and the animal crashed into the fire. Sparks went everywhere. The fire went out and Adjul passed out. When he next woke, he had no idea how much time had gone by. It was daytime, and the fever, which had given him the nightmares for days, the fever had broken, and his head was clear, and his body wasn't sweating. And he kind of hoisted himself up a little bit on his elbows, and the girl was sitting on the other side of the fire, which had, of course, been remade. The Jaguar body was nowhere to be seen, and she was working on a on a piece of a fairly good sized piece of uh, uh, skin uh, with a needle uh, and thick thread made out of something. Working on it. when she saw him raise up, she immediately got up and brought him a gourd, which is a hollowed out. Um, either a hollowed out shell or a hollowed out uh, dried um, a piece of heavy fruit skin. She brought him a gourd of water and felt his forehead. And he was on his elbows and looking down, both legs were bandaged, were bandaged with white, cloth, blood-stained white cloth, all the way from the ankles to the above, the, way above the knees. And she checked the bandages to make sure there was no fresh blood. And he lay back down and signed, because remember, there's a universal sign language that operated with the ancient people, signed that he was really hungry. <laughs> and she gave a smile and brought him some broth with little bits of meat in it, he didn't know that he'd been out for days. Um, and she, he barely, she barely been able to wake him to get him to drink something, but not to, not to eat. And he had been very feverish. And he also didn't know that the nightmares, he had been screaming at night. Uh, he'd, he'd start screaming in the middle of the night from these nightmares that he had about being drowned underwater, about being attacked by big beasts, and, and so forth. And um, she had tended him and tended him. And now the fever had broken, and he was hungry, and his recovery started. She tended his legs, which were horribly wounded, uh, keeping them wrapped keeping the bandaging moist. One day she um, disappeared for a long time in the forest and came back with a huge, huge honeycomb that she'd gotten out of a bee's nest. And she took his bandages off. The wounds in his legs were unbelievable. And she wiped, uh, she spread honey 
over the wounds and then rewrapped his legs. And gradually, he started to recover. She kept working on this uh, piece of skin. Um, and, you know, he could see as he looked across the fire at her that it was jaguar skin. She kept working on it day in and day out, tending him, feeding him. And they began to converse through sign language. And he found out that her name was Ita. And she came from far, far to the north. She had come to see the temple because her great-grandfather had been a priest in the temple many, 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 many years before. Her grandfather had moved the family north when the land around the temple, because there had been a big city around the temple, uh, started the crops started failing. The land couldn't support the crops. So her grandfather had moved the family way, way to the north, but she'd heard about her great-grandfather for years and decided she wanted to come down and, and see if there was anything left of the temple. And she'd been there about a week, and she said she'd looked all through the area, and there were there was evidence of what had been a city, but it was pretty much um, covered with, had disintegrated. And there were vines and bushes and stuff covering what were the, the, the remains of buildings and houses, but there wasn't very much. The temple, the pyramid, was such a huge thing that it had survived. And she had come back to her camp one day after she'd been there about a week and heard the roar of the jaguar that attacked Adzul out of the temple. And she had raced to the scene to see him just about unable to hold the jaguar off anymore. And the jaguar had been so distracted with attacking Adzul, she'd been able to get four, uh, six, five, six, seven feet away and fire spears into it with her throwing stick, which is called an atlatl. Um, it's a throwing stick that, that you put, it has a notch in the end of it. And it's uh, maybe three feet long. And you put the end of the spear in it. And then you balance the spear with your left hand. And you leverage, you throw you the um, throwing stick forward. And it acts like a, um, like a lever. And it fires a spear at a much greater power than you can do with your, with your arm. And she put two spears into the jaguar and killed it. And then she dragged, carried him back to her camp and started caring for him. And two nights later, the second jaguar attacked. And he said, well, you saved my life twice. And she said, no. She said, the armor skin, or the armor shirt saved your life the first time. She said, when I took it off, she said, I, uh, to tend, tend to you, I, she said, I could not believe it. It's not even damaged. I mean, that, that shirt, that's, and he explained to her about the weave on the armor shirt and so on. And um, gradually, gradually, his legs started to heal. And the week went by, and two weeks, and three weeks went by. And he got stronger and stronger, and they made plans to go on north because she said, my village is to the north, and he had told her about having to flee the empire. He'd also told her about the conquistadors, and she had told him that her father had gone to their capital city, uh, which was called Tenochtitlan, and had encountered conquistadors there and knew about them and came back and moved the village way, way far away down by the ocean because she said the same thing that Adzul knew. These conquistadors will do anything for gold. They go into the countryside anywhere to try to find gold. So they, you know, they compared stories and he told her why he, his father had told him to get out of the get out of the um, 
empire? And she said, yes. She said, I noticed that piece of silver on your chest when I took the shirt off. And um, she said, I, I started to try and, and uh, take it off. And it got very, very, it didn't burn me, but it got very, very hot. So I left it alone. And I figured it wasn't supposed to come off around your neck. So anyway, they he gradually, gradually healed. And weeks went by. And finally, he was able to walk. And she had told him her village would welcome him. He, he had to go somewhere. And his father had told him to get out of the empire and go to friendly people to the north. And she said, our, our people, which are the Aztec people, will welcome you with open arms. So they made plans to head out. And on the last night in the camp, she gave him, she handed him the piece of skin she'd been working on all these weeks. And he said, what is this? And she said, slip it over your head. And it was a mask. It was the mask a mask made from the head skin of the second jaguar, the one who'd attacked in camp. And the skin went down to, to his chest and down his back and over his shoulders. And the, um, the eyes, the, op the mouth had been sewed closed, but the eye holes were open and the ears had been sewed flat on the head, so it looked like an angry cat. And he put it on, and his eyes perfectly fit the jaguar eye holes, and this, this mask fit him, covered his whole head. It was, he was, he said, he said, I don't know. He said, if I wear this, people won't know whether I'm a man or a jaguar. And she laughed and she said, well, you might have use for it sometime. And I made a leather sack for you to carry it. And she brought out a beautiful tanned leather sack that she had made during these weeks. And he put the mask in it and put it in his bundle. And the next day they set off. A month later, they veered west, that is to the left, off the trader's path. And a few days after that, they came to over the top of a high ridge. And down below them was flat land and a huge expanse of water, blue water, stretching as far away as the eye could see. And Agile stopped. And he said, I've only seen this once before when I was a very little boy. Before we fled the, the, uh, uh, the um, emperor's palace, my father took me and had me look out over this water. I've never seen it again. And down below them, waves were breaking on a white sandy beach and gulls were diving around. And, and off in the distance was a village. And by afternoon, they had come off the ridge and approached the village. And there were little one-story white houses on either side of a street and then as they approached the village, they came to plots, garden plots, where people were working. And people started yelling greetings to Ita. And Adzul caught them kind of looking strangely at him. And anyway, they walked through the garden plots to the village, and there were a bunch of people. It was late afternoon, a bunch of people out in the street of the village, and a woman broke free from the crowd and rushed to Ida and threw her arms around her. Two of them held on to each other. The woman uh, was crying. And finally, Ida um, introduced Adzul to her mother. 
and explain what had happened. And Adjul said, your daughter, because now he could speak Aztec. They had taught each other the language. He could speak. He said, your daughter saved my life three times. Once with the first Jaguar attack, once with the second Jaguar attack, and the third time, I never would have survived the wounds without her care. And Vito's mother looked at his legs, which had these enormous scars showing all over his legs, and they were still red. They weren't white. They, he hadn't, it wasn't long enough. Enough time hadn't gone by to turn them into white scars. They were still red and, and sore. And she said, you come on to the house. I have some salve to put on those legs that will help a lot. And so Adzul joined Ida's family. And her father's name was Talak. And her brother's uh, name was Quattle. And he was about 15. And Ida was about 20. About Adzul's age. And way back when she had been taken care of him, he had been stunned at how beautiful she was. Black hair, down her back, a beautiful uh, oval, almond-shaped face, brown eyes. She was beautiful, and she was, um, I mean, he thought to himself a number of times, a beautiful woman with the skills of a warrior because of the way she could throw those spears. Anyway, he, he joined them in the household. <laughs> the first night that he was there, they, uh, Ida's mother made tortillas. And they folded food into the tortillas and roll, rolled the tortillas up and handed one to him. And he, he didn't know what to do with it. So he just held it in his hands. And to lock, the father finally said, let me show you how to eat that. And he took his own, the lock did, and in two hands and tipped it, and then took a bite out of the end, and then turned it back level so it didn't spill any more food out. And uh, Tlaloc realized that, that uh, Agile was waiting to see how they ate these things. And uh, uh, Tlaloc said, don't you, have, don't you have this kind of food? Do the Inca people have this kind of food? And Agile said, well, we do have kind of flat cakes, but we, we, we eat little potatoes and vegetables, and we do more soup than we, than we eat like this. But he said, this is really good. And he learned how to eat his tortillas very quickly. So the day started, and every day, the family would work in their garden plot. And Adjul uh, would go and help them. Well, now, there were two reasons. One, he wanted to give, he wanted to contribute to the family. But the other was he didn't want to be too far away from Ida. And her mother noticed this and smiled to herself, for she could see that there was a bond between them. Well, uh, the other thing he did was he, because he was just a natural with the sling, he went out into the hills and, and hunted with the sling for food for the village because they, they didn't have, they had some pigs and chickens and stuff, but they didn't have a whole lot of wild meat. And so he hunted in the hills and he could, he could kill a, a de, you know, a, a desert sheep. He could kill a desert. He had hit him in the head with a rock and it'd kill him. And wild pigs and um, some birds, pheasants and stuff. Uh, Quattle came back and told his friends and told the people in the village, Adjul can hit a flying bird in the head with a rock. 
And so he had two roles. He, one was he became a, a food provider for the village, and the second was he helped the family farm their, uh, their plot for vegetables and all kinds of stuff. Well, after he'd been there about a week, all of a sudden, this Aztec guy started showing up at the end of the day in the family plot and talking to Ida and taking Ida back into the village with him. And Adzul watched this for a while, and finally he asked her brother, Quattl, what, uh, who's that? And it's Quatli, really. It's the, the, the Aztec names are hard to pronounce. But Quatli kind of was no dummy. And he said, oh, well, why do you ask? And Adjo said, well, I, I just, you know, was interested in, in who, who he might be. And Quatli said, well, that's Yoti. And Yoti is going to marry Ida. And Adzul said, really, well, uh, she's going to marry her? And Quatley said, oh, yeah, they've been, uh, it's been planned for them to be married since they were little kids. Well, why, why do you ask? What, what? And Adzul said, well, um, I just think she ought to marry somebody who's worthy of her, who's a worthy warrior, worthy man for her. Well, um, Quatley kind of smirked behind his back and kept a straight face and changed the subject. But it soon became apparent that Ida really liked Adzul. And they get into the village or walking to and from the farm plots and Yoti, if he happened to be in the area, got ruder and ruder to Adzul, bumping into him, not apologizing, and starting to talk bad about him to the other men in the in the village, saying he's just a he's a you know he's just trying to get in with the family. He's he's. A, a stranger from the south. I don't know if we can trust him, blah, 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 on and on. And it got, got pretty bad. It went on for about three, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. It got pretty bad. And finally, one day, all the people at the afternoon, all the people were sort of gathered in the, there were, there were not a lot of people. I mean, the village was maybe 60, 70 people total, men, women, children maybe 80, not a lot. And they were all gathered in the street before they went to their houses to have supper. And um, Yoti uh, gave uh, Adzul a hard bump with his shoulder as he went by and then walked down the street and talked to some men. And Adzul got quietly and went over to where one of the women had some vegetables, and he picked out a big grapefruit. And he said to Quadley, now I want you to go down the street. He said, I want you to go down the street and stand down there. He pointed a spot about 25 yards away. He said, I want you to put this grapefruit on your head and face me. And Quadley goes, okay. And so he went down the street about 25 yards, put the grapefruit on his head, and Adzul started swinging. They were standing in the middle of the street, and Adzul got his sling, loaded it, and started swinging, you know, full five-foot swing, around and around. He kept it going. And pretty quick, people stopped talking and started paying attention, because he did not, he didn't, he just kept the sling going, and it made a, a whirring. And he kept it going around his head, whirring and whirring and whirring. And when he had everybody's attention, he let fly. Now the stone, a stone out of a sling, as I probably said, 
to leave the sling on full force at about 100 miles an hour. It was so fast, the people really couldn't follow the flight of the stone. What they did see was the grapefruit explode into a million pieces from the top of Quatley's head. And after that, Yoti stopped trying to see Ita and started meeting with another girl in the village. About 10 days after that, Adjul and Ita were walking out by the ocean, which is yeah, a quarter of a mile away from the village. It was a beautiful night. The sun was going down. The gulls were diving. The, the waves were coming in, breaking on the shore. Not big waves, little waves. It's just a beautiful night. And Adjul asked Ita if she would marry him. And she agreed. A week later, they were to, they were having the wedding ceremony. Now, the what the Aztec wedding this is real. The Aztec wedding ceremony was was quite interesting. It was very simple. Um, somebody had offered uh, uh, Agile and Ida a little whitewashed house. These houses were made out of adobe and whitewash um, to live in for their new home. And what they did was they sat on a mat side by side at the door of their house, what was going to be their new house. And uh, Ida had beautiful flowers in her hair. She had a wonderful blouse on that her mother had made for the occasion. And um, and Adzul was sitting there, and Ida's mother, well, out in front of them, on the mat, was a long-sleeved um, shirt on in front of Adzul, and a long-sleeved blouse in front of Ida, lying on the mat in front of each of them. And Ida's mother approached and came up and tied the left arm of Adjul's shirt to the right arm of Ida's blouse. They were, the, the two garments were side by side on the ground, tied them together in a knot. And that signified that they were married. And as soon as that was done, all the people started bringing food, and there was a big celebration. And this started in the early evening and went on, and they lit torches, and everybody, they were having a big celebration. And it got dark. And uh, it was just about time to to break up the celebration. Everybody was talking, and they were just getting ready to end the wedding when a figure stumbled out, down, out of the street into the firelight. All were outside the, the new house of Adjul and Ida's and fell on the ground was covered with blood. People, everything stopped. Adzul leaped up and ran and turned the man over and got his arm under his shoulders. The guy had was covered with blood. He had his scalp. He had a terrific wound in his head. His scalp was partially hanging open. He was covered with blood and Adjul said, get, get him a drink, get him a drink. And somebody quickly got a gourd of water and they poured water down the guy's throat and he 
He jerked open and his eyes got really, really wide. And he yelled, they're coming. Everyone's dead but me, they're coming. And that is the end of the story for today. Now, for those of you who haven't read the book, have your hand at trying a page or so of what you think is going to happen next. For those of you who have read the story, eh, come up with a different kind of writing exercise that is imaginative, because you know what happens next, but come up with a different writing exercise out of your imagination that would be uh, interesting to, as a, to present to me next time.